What's up? It's Alexander23, and I just did an incredible interview with the Zach Sang Show. It was very fun. We talked about my new album, Aftershock, and going on tour with John Mayer and working with Olivia and a whole bunch of cool stuff. And I think you should watch it because it was great. Hello, beautiful human. My name is Zach. That's Dan. And we welcome to our new studio that's figuring itself out. Thank you. I'm honored to be here. Alexander 23. <laughs> Let's go. We did it. We made it. We made it. You did. But you were just talking about you don't track vocals with headphones. I do, but I track them with like it, like barely, barely on. Something about it, it always feels weird for me hearing my voice uh, just so close to my ear. I like hearing it in the room and how it feels. How do you listen to final mixes? How do you produce? Uh, what do you use then? Um speakers i like hearing how it like bounces off the walls and, and feels in a room really you know? yeah very much so i know i mean i'm obviously checking it on everything you know just to make sure it works but will you use airpods or anything like that yeah of course i'm still a person in 2022 but <laughs> but, but like <laughs> at what stage do you take a song and go i want to test it on in every different element right Usually not until the mixing stage. Okay. Because then it's more of like a technical problem of like this needs to sound good on everything. But before then, it just needs to feel good. How long are you sitting with this debut album before you choose to share it with the world? Which, by the way, so congratulations. Uh, thank you, dude. I'm glad this is a perfect way to celebrate. Um, quite a while. I mean, the first song was written almost two years ago now. So it's been a long, it's been a really long journey. But, What's uh, what, what song starts it? It's a song called Live Me Forever. It's actually it's still one of my favorites on the entire thing. And I actually wrote it before I put out my last EP. And I was going to put it on the EP and I was just like, this just doesn't feel right. This feels like it belongs in its own world. And like the subject matter is so different from the EP. Like, let me save this for, I didn't, I didn't know it was going to be an album yet, but let me save this for what eventually became the album. Does that song set a story tone, a sonic tone? Yeah, I think I didn't even fully realize it then, but now looking back, it certainly did just about like exploring like grief uh, in, in so many different capacities. And I think a lot of the album is about that. And that's a song written just by you. Yep. And produced 100% by you. Yep. I actually did it in, I went to, I did the most cliche ever uh, thing ever. I had a very bad breakup and I went to Big Bear by myself and stayed in a cabin and uh, wrote some songs. And that was the only song that survived, but it kind of started it all. That's beautiful, but also painful, right? Oh, very much so. But I think it's necessary, you know? Like, sometimes you got to just go in and let yourself feel those things. I mean, it's cliche, but I think it's cliche because it's true. W do you write any other songs on this trip, or is this the only one that you walk away with? Oh, I wrote a bunch of other songs. They, they sucked, most of them. <laughs> yeah, and this one, just luckily, I got one, you know? A lot of songwriting is like, it's this magical mix of, like, skill and lucky, and you try and make yourself skilled enough to get lucky and when you get lucky you hope that you're skilled enough to capture the moment and that was just one of those times so how do you know that that's the one that deserves a shot it's a good question i think i've actually been kind of changing how i listen to my own music recently i think hmm. up until this album i was really concerned with impressing myself i was like how impressed am I by these lyrics and this production and the combination of the two and harmonically how it's laid out in the arrangement. And it was, I, I felt like I had so much to prove to myself of like, like I can make this stuff by myself. I can do this. I can do that. And now my perspective is kind of shifted to like more of a fan perspective of like, how much do I enjoy listening to this? Like just pure enjoyment, not being super anecdotal about it. Just like, how much do I enjoy the experience of listening to this song? And this this album is full of just songs that I just love listening to. How do you define enjoyment? I think it's a it's it's more of like a foo foo thing. It's more of a feeling, you know. Like I used to like look for like this lyric is crafted perfectly. I'm so proud of this. People are gonna be impressed by this. And now it's just like in my like gut, like what does it feel like listening to this song? And if it's like a gut reaction that is super positive regardless of the subject matter because obviously a lot of the songs are sad but you can still have a positive reaction to a sad thing so i'm just looking for this like this this intangible feeling interesting because it is intangible definitely hard to define because it is positive but it's off of something sad mm -hmm. so is the glimmer of positivity people feeling understood by a record yeah i think so and i think like i i i write about sad stuff but i try to do it with a twist of hope like it's never just like well this can I swear in here? Yeah, yeah this fucking sucks and everything's fucked. <laughs> like that's never that's not how I feel about stuff. So I hope that that's not how people like listen to the songs because 
I want them to feel like, oh, wow, like this sucks for him too. The same way it sucks for me, but he's not giving up and I shouldn't either, you know? Do you feel like you don't give up on situations because, let me rephrase that. Does making songs about shitty situations help you not give up? Definitely. Um, Because it's cataloged proof that this has happened before, it'll happen again, and I was fine after that, and I'll be fine after this. It's, it's a, just it's proof. Yeah, it's, it's understanding it's history, proof. right? I mean, it's literally a diary. Like yeah. that's what my music is. It's just like it's. I, I like to think of it as like an emotional toolbox. Like when I'm feeling this way, I can go to this song and like remind myself of like, okay, this happened before. It'll happen again. It's okay. It's gonna be fine. A diary that for you started when you were in the seventh grade, and a girl said to you, like, "Win me back with a record. Make yeah, me a song." Literally, I broke up with her, and I wanted her back, and she stuck to her guns. She was like, "You know what? <laughs> You're gonna have to prove it to me that you really want me back." And that's why I wrote my first song and. It fucking worked. I mean, for better and for worse. And now I'm still writing songs trying to win girls back. So I mean, literally nothing's are. changed. <laughs> yeah, nothing. Literally nothing. It's insane. Do you remember that song? Of course. I will not sing it, but I do remember it. It was it was called Without a Why. That's the name. Very With, poetic for a 12 year old. Whoa. Without yeah. a Why. Can you expand on that, please? It was, uh, it was basically like, I don't know why I broke up with you. Mm. It was just like a 12 year old, I'm a shitty 12 year old boy anthem of just like, I made a mistake. Take me back, please. Interesting. Anthem is maybe a bit rambunctious of the term, but a it was an anthem of sorts for what it was. For you in that yeah, moment? sure, of course. And maybe if you release it one day, work yeah, it into another song? Exactly. Aftershock. That is the name of the debut album Yep. that is out now. Mm-hmm. What What does that word mean to you? I mean, is it... It can mean a lot of things. Yeah. I mean, I know what it means to me. Uh the album is kind of about this like emotional radius of a, of a breakup of like, you know, like right before the breakup, during it, right after meeting new people, you know, living in a world post this person. And so if you kind of consider the breakup, the earthquake, then this album is, is the aftershock. It's the response, you know. But there is more on this album than just breakup anthems, breakup mm-hmm. records. Dude, I, I found myself bawling my eyes out over the hardest part this morning Mm -hmm. that is yeah you're able to capture grief and death in a way that i had never heard before well yeah i mean first of all thank you um i think it's more than a breakup album but i think the breakup and especially like the specifics of the breakup gave me a new perspective on on a lot of things and um i think i took that perspective on to songs like the hardest part or everything's fine that aren't about you know breakups and and it really helped me write those i think with like a, a new sense of self uh of self really but yeah the hardest part i was just talking to a friend about this earlier like that like that song fucking sucked to write it wasn't fun to like record and that was kind of one of the first experiences i've had like that where i still felt compelled to do it because even when i've written about like heartbreak and things that sucked like it still was like fun to make music that one like wasn't fun but I still felt it was like so important to make it so that was a really new experience for me what, the hardest part of getting old is that some people that you love don't I mean yeah blunt but yet beautiful and in a way that I've never heard expressed before totally why w- did you need to make it what compelled these emotions I mean to be like honest and frank just like I've had some friends pass away, you know, in the last year. And and I'm very fortunate to say that this is kind of the first period of my life where that's starting to happen. And it sucks so much. It's just the worst thing ever. It's so unbelievably permanent. And the kind of like butterfly effect of it within your own life is just so great to see that, like, you know, start in like a more like immediate community and work its way out. It's just like so heartbreaking to see. And, and, um, I usually write songs that are like so specific to me and only live within my trauma and my grief. And this was the first time like kind of expanding outside of that and like attempting to write a song that touched so many other people so directly. And that's, I think why I felt so much pressure to make it amazing was because I was like, this is bigger than me. Like I owe it to their family. I owe it to their friends to make this as as good as possible. You make it with one person in mind. Um, yeah, I mean, certainly there was, there was one person that the song is, is mostly about, but I, I did have, you know, other friends that passed away and it was definitely in paying homage to, the, to them as well and their families. Is it hard to share that with the family? Of- I, it's, I think, you know, it's, it is, I don't know if it's hard to share. I was nervous to share it 
it wasn't necessarily difficult, but I was nervous. I think the harder piece, to be honest, was just promoting it. Mm-hmm. Like it felt so grief baby of just like, hey, like, you know, like, what do you do? Like, hey, have you lost a friend too? Like, listen to this song. Like I was, I was and still am so lost as far as like how, but at the same time, it's, it's a double sword because I want people to hear it and I think it can help people. So it's like towing the line between those two things was definitely really difficult and continues to be. Yeah. It will, it, you bring up something really interesting, right? Like how do you share your music with the world without it looking like you're milking something or taking advantage of it's hard, a hard situation that either in your life or in somebody else's. It, I mean, it's really hard. I, I wish I had the answer, you know, I think my favorite way to do it. And I'm not just saying this cause you're here is to do stuff like this. That's yeah. longer form where you can actually have a, a chance to really talk about it. But like, I mean, it's hard to, you know, you, know, you, you post a TikTok, you have about three seconds to win someone's attention, you know? And sometimes the way that I know will get the most attention is things that I'm just not comfortable with, you know? And so it's like balancing those two is, is a difficult thing. How'd you know this song was right before you released it? Like, was there something that just like blatantly stuck out? Um, I don't think I knew it was right and ready to release until I'd sent it to the family and got their blessing. You know, like when I first wrote it, I wrote it with my friend, uh, Amy Allen. I finished it with Dan Nigro, the, the writing and production of it. And like when I first wrote it, I literally, my, I, I had two thoughts in my head after I wrote it. One, I think this is amazing. Two, I'm never going to put this out. Really? And it wasn't kind of until I got their blessing and I felt so proud of it that I was like, okay, I think not only sh- I, like I should put it out, but I need to put this out. Why were you okay or at peace with not releasing it? Um, Because I don't write music for release. Like that's just never been the way I do it. Like I don't like writing for sport. I only write when I have something to write about and it's a cathartic, you know, thing for, for me to do. And it's, it's for me. You know, obviously after I release it, I hope it touches the most amount of people possible and I hope it is successful. You know, I want to be a a successful artist, but that's never like the intention going in. How do you balance not writing for sport and also writing for other people or being in a session for somebody else? Well, it's just different. It's different muscles. It's like playing different sports, you know, like they, they obviously build on each other and have like a ton of crossover, but it's more like when I'm, my music is just so like my music and me is one the Venn diagram is one circle. My entire identity is wrapped up in my music. So it's harder for me to separate that when I'm writing for someone else. It's like this amazing experience to like be the co-pilot. And I love to relinquish that control because with my music, I I'm so the pilot, like I'm so the director of it to a point where like, I actually look for opportunities to like, to support someone else's vision. Huh. How do you support somebody else's vision while make sure that your ideas at least get heard? Um, I think it's just about being selective about who you work with, you know, making sure it's the right fit. Like I used to just do sessions and sessions and sessions and, and you know, just any opportunity. And now I'm a bit more uh, choosy. And I think it, that's not just be. to the benefit, of course, but yeah. it's not just to the benefit of me. It's to the benefit of people I'm working with. You know, I'm yeah. in, in a, an amazing position where I can only take on things I think I can actually be useful in. We are talking to one of the biggest producers in the last like year or so. <laughs> so, I mean, that is true. Well, thank you. I need to thank you, thank me, thank the statistics. What the fuck? <laughs> thank the data, thank the charts, baby. You know? Yeah. It's pretty crazy. It's nuts. It's it, nuts. I think I started having success with both my artist career and my uh, career producing and writing for other people when I stopped delineating between the two as much and started seeing them both as like a, a form of expression. That's really cool. But different. But how would you describe the different muscles? Um. I think it's it's more of a control thing. Like it's still like me imprinting my taste and uh, on you know music. You know that that much is definitely the same. Like if I'm producing for someone else, I'm still doing stuff that I think is cool. You know, so it's just like a it's like when it's for me, I have a final say. When it's not for me, I don't. And that's a beautiful thing to me. I love the balance of those two. <laughs> just letting something go. Yeah. I mean, obviously, like if someone was like, "No, I think it should be like this," and I'm like. I don't think it should be that. I just wouldn't do it, too. You yeah, know, like that's also true. Why was "Help uh, Hate Me If It Helps" the right song to introduce this n- new era, but also like your debut album? Yeah, amazing question. For me, it was the right song because it gave me the same feeling in my gut that um, the first song I ever put out, "Dirty Eighth Ones," gave me, where I was like, I don't think anyone else could have made this song in this moment. You know, 
And that's a really good feeling. And that for me is kind of like the North star of like, am I making the right music? Nobody else can make this. Just like songwriting, lyricism, production wise. Like I'm not saying it's the best song ever, but I think it was the best song for me at that moment. And it just felt like the right way to kind of like start everything back up. That's a really healthy gauge. Thanks. Because it's focused solely on you. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, still keeping an eye on what else is going on. Yeah, I think that's all you can do. Like, I don't get to, like, my album's out. I don't get to decide which songs people like, you know? Like, that's that's up to them now. I can only decide, like, before, like, what feels the most true to me. And so, okay, Crash. Mm-hmm. I miss you, but I don't miss us. Because apart, we're great, but together we suck. Mm-hmm. It's true. I've been in situations where, like, I don't hate this person, but when we're together, it's brings yeah. out the shittiest side of both of us sometimes the, the some of the parts is not greater and that was kind of a situation i was in it's definitely a crass way of, of saying it and a bit like exaggerated but for sure yeah does this song help you realize that it's not right or do you only write it after you realize <sighs> for me the songwriting thing is usually the end of the realization you know like a lot of people write in the middle of feeling certain feelings for yeah me. like if i'm like in the middle of feeling something super strong like the last thing I want to do is write a song. It's like after I've felt that, given myself some time to feel that, then I want to write the song. So it's like the end of the chapter. So you pro- but, you process before um, you yes, write? exactly. And then the writing is like the last. It's like the, okay, now I got it, you know? It's a period, not a dot, dot, dot. Yes, uh, exactly. I wish I came up with that. That's good. It's <laughs> mm, really cool. But yeah, I mean, that, that song specifically was a really important realization for me of like, you can miss someone and not miss who you became with that person when you were together. Like those two things are, are, um, they're like, they're not mutually exclusive. Or, or they, no, that's whatever. correct. Yeah, whatever. I think. Yeah. <laughs> I've only had one cup of coffee. It's, 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 it's release day. It's release day. Do you wake up this morning excited, nervous? How do you feel? It's almost like n- all of the above, none of the above, where it's just, there's like so much stuff going on and my phone is just going so berserk that like I can't, don't even have time to feel how I feel yet. I think it'll hit me in like a week well, and I'm hoping that it hits me in a good way. Yeah. I think it will. <laughs> it feels good to have these songs. I mean, the coolest part about writing an album, one of the coolest parts is um, I get to like be done with these songs in a certain way you know like obviously now they like live in a different capacity but i've just like had them to myself for so long now and it feels so good to just be like okay they're yours now like you guys got to deal with all these emotions like i've dealt with them what allows you to not move on but also like feel new things and capture new stuff very much so because you've been sitting i mean you teased okay somebody's nobody Mm -hmm. you you play that in march and you literally go it's probably never going to come out so what <laughs> what changes there? Because now it's out. Um, sometimes I just say crazy shit. <laughs> I guess I think that one was always coming out. Um, yeah, I, I love that song. That song went through a lot of different iterations. You know, like some songs on the record. Right away, I like knew the vibe I wanted. That one kind of fought back a little bit. But what do you mean by fought back? Like, like it started as just like a piano ballad, just like a like a Wurlitzer vocal ballad. Okay. And I was like, no, this is lame. So me and Dan made it into like this crazy fast, like program drummy feel. And then we were like, okay, this is, this is not lame enough. <laughs> and then, uh, finally after just weeks of trying, we, we settled on the final production and I'm stoked with where it, it ended up. It feels like the perfect presentation of the song. There is pressure to dress it right because mm-hmm. the production in any song it does tell a portion of the story. Totally. How like do you look at it in a ratio perspective or like how, do you get what I'm saying? Yeah, no, totally. I, for me, the song, the song is the is like the leading actor, and the production is like the best supporting uh-huh. role. You know, and it's like interesting. They have to work together, but like the song is like the 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 kernel. It's like it's where it all starts and stuff. And then the production from for me, at least from my music, is like how do I best support the song. Got it. Have you uh, talked to Armando about your album? I mean, I told him it's out. It's up to him to respond at this point. He's been ignoring me, so it's really sad. Yeah, I might need to reach out to Grubhub, like <laughs> corporate, and just get make, his information. You know, like be like, what's going on with this guy? Just make sure he's okay. That's really what I want to know. I mean, you know, safety first. Exactly. His yeah. health is priority. He's out here delivering food. You know, how the whole how the whole thing start? 
Um, I had a uh, grub hub driver named Armando, <laughs> and uh, he was a great guy, and it's it spurred a whole relationship of me kind of sharing my music with him, and and him uh, seldom, if ever, responding. <laughs> Uh, but I still send, you know, I hope he comes to my tour this fall. You know, I still send him the dates, you know, and the links and the smart links and all this stuff. Send him my music video this morning. Hopefully he watches it. Oh, sick. But I'm not counting on it because <laughs> he does not respond to me. So I wonder who's seeing those messages. That's a good question. Certainly not Armando. No. <laughs> Well, speaking of the music video this morning, what a plot twist. Oh, uh, yeah. You like that one? If we were a party, yeah. How'd you come up with that idea? Um... I was just like, what's the craziest thing I could do? And so um, that's what I came up with. I was like, let's make the most insane big budget video and then have a little plot twist going on in it. So you guys like, would you go out to the desert, film an entire explosion? You're like, that's it? Yep. This is all we're doing? Yep. I literally, I mean, spoiler alert for anyone who hasn't seen the video, but blew the entire budget on the first, you know, 35 (laughs) seconds. For real? Yeah. And my label was definitely... Like they were cool with it, but I don't think they really realized like what I was going to do, you know, <laughs> like I like actually did it, you know, and then after we're like, wait, this is crazy like that. We actually did that. And so then we uh, had the, the, the puppy sequence at the end because we were like, I think it needs a little more juice. And who doesn't love puppies? I mean, only terrible people no, don't love puppies. puppies. It's cheating. It's literally <laughs> cheating. It's so funny. Does the video... Does it, how does it tie into the song or is there no like correlation there's no correlation I was like I want to like be Jason Bourne I want to be Fast and Furious right now like how can I John Wickify myself and you did and I did for 40 seconds yes and it was awesome <laughs> it was fun to do like maybe that's my future you know just action movie star you're handsome enough you to see do it? it oh thank you yeah yeah I think I could yeah if music doesn't work if this album doesn't do well I think I'll just go full action movie guy do you have a good relationship with the record label um Grateful, yeah, I do, which is crazy. Even after the video? They entertain my stupid fucking ideas, <laughs> and they let me do them, and that's all I could ever ask for out of a label, you know? Do you feel, like, trust? Like, how do you take that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's about, like, the genesis of the relationship, you know, and it was built on trust, and it was, like, it was, you guys like what I'm doing and want me to do what I want to do, and so if, like, a relationship is founded upon that, you know, it makes it a lot easier to maintain. You brought up your first song ever. Um, but also I, I want to know transitionally, like what is the sonic difference to you or the, the, the difference between listening to Air Force Ones, even I don't know you yet mm-hmm. and what we have today? Um, I think it's a confidence, I would say. Mm-hmm. I think I was, um, I was a lot more minimal then cause I think I was afraid to add stuff. Um, cause I didn't know how to add stuff and still make it tasteful and intentional. And I think I've gotten to a point now where I'm a lot more confident being a bit more of a maximalist producer than I was before. Is it that you didn't know how, or you just were afraid to try? Like, would you listen? I think a little bit of both. And I, I, it was those two also mixed with like, I think I, and I'm realizing this is kind of like a big theme for me personally, but like, I just needed to prove to myself that I could do it that way first you know, to like allow myself to then graduate to this, I think a bit more like grandiose sound. So what do you learn or prove to yourself? What do you realize that you can do from those records? Um, like I could make everything by myself and have it be minimal and, and weird and, and it can work. Yeah. And know? still be successful. Yeah. And now, now that I have that, it's, it's super liberating. Cause now I'm like, well, I, now I can just do whatever I want. Like now it's just like, it's very, very freeing to be like, I don't have to prove to myself anymore. Does Dan Nigro help in this process? So much. You yeah. must have learned a ton. Yeah. I mean, like, that's, like, we spent so much fucking time together. <laughs> like, so I literally, like, it's funny, like, to the point where, like, now when you say his name, like, the first thing that pops in my head isn't even us in the studio. It's us, like, getting sandwiches, <laughs> you know, on the east side somewhere. You know, like, literally, like, he just became one of my best friends. And I don't think people even fully understand how good he is. Like, this shit's not an accident. It didn't just, like, happen. Like, he's that good. That's why it happened, you know? So what do you learn from him? Um, I mean, so much stuff. I think the biggest thing that I learned, I'm going to stick with in the studio stuff, um, <laughs> is, uh, is, like, the difference between good and great 
is so fucking big and like something that is good will not help you or your career and something that is great will change your life mm -hmm. and he is always in pursuit of finding something that is great and he will take any amount of time to do it that's interesting you know like when you hear a good song you're like okay that was a good song and you don't listen to it again when you hear a great song you listen to it a thousand times how do you know the difference between good and great? I think you you don't know and it's not up to you, but you can just do your best to try and find it, you know? And and that's when it, it kind of goes back to like what I'm looking for in music now isn't like, you know, I'm obviously trying to do cool lyrics and cool production and make things interesting harmonically and all that stuff. But like, I'm really looking for that feeling of like, this feels special. And I think the best producers just have that intuition. They have that taste and then... Dan knows when he hears something special, at least whatever special means to him. Interesting. It's just being in touch with your own taste, I think is the biggest thing. There's so many people that don't even know what they like, you know? And I'm guilty of that as well sometimes too. And I think the most successful people know what they like. But they're like, their taste is connected to the larger taste. Sure. I mean, the that's, when you, that's when you get like the, the big kaboom of success, you know, is when you know what you like and what you like is agreed upon by, you know, the masses. Well, they nailed it with sour. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Working on a project like that, does it realign your priorities for your own? Um, I think it's just like a, it's more than anything, it's encouraging to see like what, what I deem as like incredible music have that much success. It just makes it feel possible, you know? Because it's like everything's so fast paced nowadays, it's easy to kind of get down on yourself and be like, this is just this is just so fucking hard, you know, like and then to see your friends, you know, and luckily I was I'm very grateful to have been a part of it, but make something uh, so good that is so successful is really cool. It's pretty outstanding. It's the craziest thing ever. How do you define success? Uh, money in my bank account. Truly? No. Um, well, I think that, you know, what's funny is like, because I've thought of like money and fame that they're like a, they're a decent like indicator though, mm -hmm. because like all the things that I want to achieve, like end in money and fame. So that's never like the goal. But fame is relative. But sure, of course. Right? Like, yeah. you know, you can go out and get recognized a few times and that's different than like needing security wherever you go. No, of course. And I'm not even really even like saying, like not necessarily like saying like those different like stratospheres, but like. I think success to me, I felt success when I put the hardest part out and I got tens of thousands of DMs, you know, saying how much it meant to people. What? That felt like a successful release, independent of how many streams it had. Wow. That's really special, though. Yeah. Because it's it's more than data. It's based on souls. Totally. It's harder to quantify. You know, it's hard, but like it's harder to. I, but when it is mirrored back to you, it, it feels the best. You know, that's why I've always. Um, love touring so much because you can't fake it you know like a real person needs to buy a real ticket and go to a real place to see a real show there's too many real world barriers for it to not be real it's and true so that's why it feels really special when you play a show and people sing the words back because it feels so unbelievably real so for me that's always been like a, a really important metric of of how i'm feeling and how i'm doing and you're gonna go on tour yeah this fall exciting very exciting. How do we make a show that doesn't make people ball their eyes out from top to bottom? <laughs> um, I think you will, but I think you'll be dancing at the same time. And I think that's the balance that I'm trying to create. The Sick. show, I mean, for people who haven't seen me live, like my show is um, a lot more high energy than I think you would anticipate. It's uh, more of a rock show than anything. I haven't seen you live live with the full, like I haven't seen you live since Alec Benjamin's tour. Yeah, it's wild. That's the, the years ago. Dramatically and drastically different. Wasn't well, just you with a guitar, the yeah. last, right? Literally, literally, just me and a guitar. But you learn from that so much. You're also like you're thrown into the like it's just you and yeah, the guitar. Well, I think the biggest thing you learned is how to. Uh, uh, I would say the best word is like cooperate with a crowd. Mm. You know, and like for me, it's always been so important to break down the wall in between like stage and and audience. And so I think I learned when you're forced to literally do that by yourself, just with the guitar, you learn pretty quickly how to do that. But it makes you a showman, right? Of course, yeah. Breaks the fourth wall or whatever that wall may be. Yeah, it just makes it feel them. like, like I don't know, like, and there's, and this isn't the right attitude for all shows. Some people, like, this is not how they do it, and, and it works really well for them. But for me, like, I want it to feel like a team effort, you know? Like, we're all doing the show. I just happen to be playing the guitar and singing, but it's all of our show. I want that. Yeah. Put me to work, baby. Hell yeah. Is that something you learned from touring with John Mayer? 
that's a big thing. I mean, he's the he's the the best at that. It's unbelievable. Like when he's talking into the mic and bantering with the crowd, it feels like he's talking to you. Yeah. Like to only you. And that I mean, like that's hard to achieve. It's hard to get there. But yeah, for sure. And like, yeah, I mean, John. I mean, I could go on for for <laughs> years about John. I mean, he, um, he's he's the guy. He's always been the guy for me. It was really cool to get to see him operate from so close. You know. That's yeah. That's like a master class. Yeah, I, I mean, was, he'll do things on the guitar <laughs> while singing a really complicated part that would take any other person twelve years to master. He'll do it casually. It's yeah. like a throwaway part. I mean, it's ridiculous. But also, no two shows are ever the same. I saw him three times <coughs> in L.A. and it was I watched a different show every night. I was on tour with him. I watched the show every single night. It was different every single night. It's in soundcheck every day. They'd be checking like eight new songs. That's. It also speaks to his band. I mean, like, yeah. I'm a music nerd, so, like, getting to see, like, Greg Fillingaines, who, you know, was Stevie Wonder's musical director and played on songs in the Key of Life, like, play every single night was just insane. <laughs> it's the, like, the best musician It goes on and on and on, like Aaron Sterling, Steve Ferroni on the drums. Yes. Like, Pino Palladino on the bass, Isaiah Sharkey, David Ryan Harris. And by the way, Pino was playing, he, at one point he was playing for the opener and for John. It's ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, these are these are people that just love music in a way that is so refreshing and i i relate to so much and it was so insane to every nut like not only get to play you know for arenas but to then to like literally go see my heroes from you know 10 feet away every night insane yeah and by the way it's not just opener yeba was who he was playing for yeah i don't want to you know no disrespect of course i think that's a lot is that the last time i just saw you I like there's like there's was like two weeks straight where I ran into you. It was great. A bunch. I know. I really enjoyed it. Now I got to come on your show to see you. Won't even hang out, with me, you know, outside of the studio. Well, you hang out with Hunter now. That's true. That's you know. That is true. Hunter doesn't hang out with me. Okay. Well, it feels like we could we could work this out. Maybe we could come to some terms. Mm -hmm. What are you thinking over there? Uh, can you talk about cosplay? Because I liked how you referenced that little uh, the meme with the cat cat in the yeah, bread. Oh, they, I'm glad you got that. Yeah. I was nervous. Like our. Are people going to know what the fuck I'm talking about? Is a thought that I think to myself often <laughs> while I'm writing songs. Because I'm like, these are very niche, weird internet references I'm putting in these songs sometimes. So thank you for getting that. Of course. Um, yeah, I wrote that with Jeremy Zucker. Um, That's sick. It was the last song I wrote for the record. I just felt like it needed one more song. And me and Jeremy had only written together one time. And it was the day we wrote Nothing's the Same, which is a song we put out together. And I was just like, fuck it, come over, let's write a song. And, you know, a few hours later, we had cosplay. For some reason, we just work well together. We've only written two songs together, and they both have come out, which Eight, is pretty rare. Do you finish it in one session? Uh, I think he had to, like, go to a dinner, and I, like, wrote, like, that bridge part after he left, and then it was done, yeah. Wow. Which is rare, because most of the songs of this on the album really fought back and, like, took a while. So what's the sign of a good song? Like, do you want a song <coughs> to fight back? What do you mean by fight back, though? Um, like the production isn't right. I just can't nail the production or like the second verse is just, is just not right. I can't mm -hmm. nail the second verse. Um, I don't want a song to fight back. It sucks <laughs> when it does. I'd rather it just be like cosplay where you just wrote it, you know, pretty quickly. But, um, there are songs that are worth fighting for. I think that's more the, the question is which songs are worth fighting for. And I think for me, it's the songs that most closely align with the feeling that I'm writing them about. You know, for me, I'm always trying to just get right up against that line of like, what is the emotion this song is about? Do the words, the production, the guitar riffs, everything, do they, how close to that line do they get? And if it gets close enough, I'll fight for it. Hell yeah. Was there a song on this album that almost didn't make it because you're just like, this isn't going to work out? Yeah, everything's fine. I was just like, fuck this shit. I'm tired of working on this song. Well, why and do you every time going? you go back to a song, at least for me, I don't know if other artists will feel this way. I'm, I think they will. Every time you go back to a song, to try again it gets harder and your chances get smaller because you have you're so jaded within the world of that song there's so much baggage that song holds for you and um i just really wanted it to work so much because what it was about was so important to me for share to like to share and i hadn't written a song about that before and i'm really happy that i stuck with it because it's kind of sneaky returned i used to fucking hate this song because I was like, I know this is good and I know this feels good, but I, why is this song just not coming together? And I'm finally in a, in a place where I'm just like, wow, I like this song. Again. But why did it need to be shared? Why was it imperative to the story you were telling? 
I'm kind of like what you said before of like this. It's a breakup album that's not only about a breakup. And yeah. this was a song that is not mm-hmm. about the breakup, but it's about like how I felt after the breakup in a world post breakup. And um, I just felt like it was an important piece of the puzzle. And also, like, I do think that the it is about loss and losing people you love. Yeah. And like the feeling afterwards. Yeah. And losing your, yourself, and you know, yes. along the way. Everything's fine. Is like, it's like, it's kind of inspired by a lot of stuff, but it was, it's, it was mostly inspired by. Um, when I put I don't know you yet out and things were going really well for me professionally and like personally just like within the relationship I was in and some other stuff I was just like get me out of here man like this shit is not fun and like it's so weird to go online and I'm obviously I'm grateful to even be in this position but like to go online and and see like oh my god you're amazing like we love this Mm -hmm. this is great you're great and then like put your phone down you're like but I'm fucking miserable. This shit sucks. Like I'm in a relationship that is not right for me. And that's really taking a lot out of me. And I don't know what to do. Genuinely don't know what to do. Are you grateful that you had that dichotomy? Um, I'm, I mean, now I am cause it gave me the perspective to, to write this album. And I think having those experiences in general makes your, you know, future relationships stronger because it's, it's, it's a uh, wisdom that you can take into them. But at the time I was certainly not happy about it. By the way, the album is called Aftershock. You need to listen to it. We're going to put a link in the description below. I highly prefer you listen to it on Amazon Music. Let's do it. Please. Alexa, play Aftershock by Alexander23. I couldn't find Aftershock. <laughs> oh, <laughs> God. That's yeah. really embarrassing. I'm so sorry. No, that's okay, Alexa. We'll have a talk about that later. Yeah, oh, my God. I'm blushing for her. Now she's playing I Don't Know You Yet. Right on cue with the story about oh. me feeling like shit after I put out this song. What, by the way, one of my favorite songs you've ever put out. Thank you. Alexa, stop. Alexa, stop. <laughs> thank you. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, me too. I mean, I love the song, and it, it it is so special to me. And I think so many people like despise their biggest songs, and I obviously hope and think that I will have bigger songs than that, but... uh I love that song. I love playing it on tour. Like, it's amazing to hearing to people sing it back. It makes me genuinely livid when people hate their biggest songs and even refuse to play it on their set or in their set. It's just like, just play the song. It, but like, wh- why the fuck do you think people are there? Yeah. Like, what the I fuck? think people... Yeah, I don't know why. I don't know how that even comes to fruition of you hating your biggest song. I did ter- Yeah, I mean deep 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 issues I think and also like I, I genuinely I went to a, a set at Coachella and the the per- person had one huge song that's it and they they go the whole set and it's going to be the last song and they intro the song by saying I hate playing this song I'm only going to play 30 seconds of it you're welcome and they play 30 seconds of it and then they leave yeah that's wild that's worse than not playing it yes yeah. I felt so like, like, there, like there's I'm a tasteful way stomach. to be like, look, like this song, I don't connect to the song anymore. I know you guys like it, and I, and I know you'd like to hear it, but it just pains me to play it, and I, it's uncomfortable for me, and I don't want to do it. Sure, I, I, do that. Yes, but don't don't angrily play thirty seconds like you're contractually obligated to do it. Yeah, like, like a fuck just, you. Yeah, that's ridiculous. I mean, you know what? I thought it was a really good like how John handled playing your body's a wonderland on tour. Oh. Like, because a lot of times he would give a speech before and be like, I have a complicated history with this song. Yeah. But right now, I love it. And he would just dive into it, you know, and everyone loved it. And even like the like the super guitar dudes who like clearly that's not what they came for. You can get down with it when the person is like self-aware about it. Yes. We got and John. He did waiting on a world to change as an mm-hmm. encore one night that I was there. Yeah. I mean, to have that many songs in your arsenal is just. Oh, it's sick. What a what a dream. I mean, I, I've talked to him about it and he first of all is the best dude and is so unbelievably supportive and has become just such a unbelievable friend to me, which is crazy that I can say that out loud. Um, but he was just like, you just got to keep stockpiling great songs and you'll look up, um, and you'll have people who matter to you, sing them back to you every night. And for me, that's like, that was like the, the biggest green light to just keep doing what, you know, I want to do and making songs that matter to me. And you're hearing that from somebody who is living proof that it works. I mean, 100%. W- waiting on the world to change, change my life. Blue Light, the most recent John Mayer hit, still as relevant as ever. New Light. 
Oh, New Light. Oh my yeah. God, shit. I'm so sorry. I was like, Blue Light? Did I miss a John release? Like, <laughs> no, no, no. New Light. Jesus yeah. Christ. But I, it, it, like, the music still matters. And even New Light, I mean, brought the fucking house down. And that's incredible. Everybody's able to sing it. But the thing about John that's interesting is like a lot of the songs that he put out that are my favorite John Mayer songs now, like weren't even my favorite when they got mm-hmm. released. Like he's kind of always just been on this tip of like, I'm going to make what I want to make and the people will catch up when they're ready for it. You know, like I'm going through what I'm going through right now. I'm going to write about it. Whenever you get there in your life, you'll relate to it. But I'm not going to like make music for you right now. I'm going to make music for me right now. But one, I think that's a sign of like a true tastemaker. Yeah. But also somebody who's making music for them. Yeah. Do you apply that to your own existence? A hundred percent. I make music for me. But, but is it hard to apply that perspective and then still look at data? I'm not a big data guy. Yeah, like I don't look at that stuff. I'm not like I don't know. It just doesn't get me excited. Making music gets me excited. Playing shows gets me excited. People DM me about like what the songs means to me. Them gets me excited. I obviously want to have a billion streams, so you should go stream my album right now a thousand <laughs> times, send it to all your friends and family, and make them listen to it. But yeah, it's not. It doesn't like get me excited because I can't. Because you you want to know why? Because I can't imagine it. Like it yeah. like the number. 10 million streams is awesome, but I don't know what 10 million of anything looks like. You know, like in my head, it's just too big of a number to compute. But I know what, you know, a thousand people at a show looks like, and it's fucking awesome. You know, like I can see that. It's tangible. Yeah. You rich? Uh, in the right ways, for sure. <laughs> what, Got what? a lot of uh, beautiful interpersonal relationships. So you're rich in friendship? Rich in friendship, rich in, uh, in love. Who's love? <laughs> my family and friends. Do you have a new girlfriend? No. Do you want to be single? <sighs> That's a complicated question because my my gut says yes, very much so. But I've said that in the past, and I am a believer that you don't really get to choose when certain people you know enter mm-hmm. your, your life. Um, and as closed off as I may uh, believe myself to be right now, I've I've been wrong enough times to know that I don't know. Never say never. Justin Bieber. Based on history, is your gut usually right? It depends. What do you mean? <laughs> okay, l- let's look at like, I don't know, the last six opportunities that your gut was telling you to do something and you either chose to do it or didn't. And by the time you were able to understand the impact of that decision. I think it's, it is usually right. It's certainly wrong sometimes. Don't get me wrong. I'm not like a, I'm not like a guru. But... um. <laughs> I think as I've gotten older, more so than like right or wrong, I've learned that I need to do what I want to do because I can live with myself being wrong, but I can't live with other people have, you know, being wrong, you know, like if I choose a single and it doesn't do well, but I chose it, I can live with that, you know, but if someone else chooses a single and And it doesn't do well, then it's their fault to me. And that sucks. (laughs) Whether it's true or not, that just sucks to feel that way. I get it. Do you feel compelled to live a life so you can be inspired to make music? And by live a life, I mean fall in love again, find love again. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, I need to. Like, my my music is dependent on me going out and and living. Like, it is so detail for detail about my own life that I need material to write about, you know. Could you write from imagination? I never have. Uh, Maybe that's, you know, out there for me in the future. But I, I never have, or at least when I've tried, I've not had success doing that. I don't like, like some people are really good at like writing for sport and they'll write a hundred songs for an album and pick, you know, 10. That's never really been my process. Like I'm much more just like live my life, write about it. You know, I probably wrote, like I probably finished like 15 songs for this album and put 11 of them out, you know? Wow. You're right. Most people will have 30. Yeah. That's just not my process. And I think part of it's because my my music is so lyric driven. Like I don't have just like infinite brilliant turns of phrases lying around. Like if I like, I think that for example, like the everything's fine thing, that's why I wanted to fight for it. I was like, I think this is great. Like I need to find a way to make this work. Cause I don't have just like 10 more like brilliant self realizations ready to go. If this doesn't work. You know, it's so funny that like it, it, you say that and it made me think instantly of, I don't know if you know this, but like Rivers Cuomo of Weezer, he obviously you know him, but mm-hmm. he has like a database spreadsheet system 
where he literally like will have revelations like that mm-hmm. lyrics whatever like he'll have like a like a witty line or something that he just thinks of randomly and he'll mm-hmm. put it into this database and then he'll come up with a guitar riff randomly document it in the database mm-hmm. come up with a title randomly put it in the database and he comes up with all these elements and then it essentially helps him generate songs yeah i mean i i'm not quite that organized but sure. i definitely have a similar system of just cataloging voice memos and notes and then pairing them with each other really so, yeah but it's not random i mean i'm like generally thinking about myself and my life pretty often as i think a lot of us are so, so i just you know write it down and pair the thoughts that kind of make sense together but you're pairing them yeah he like set up like a generator oh oh it's like a like a it's like, like a, a yeah he explained it right it's like a, like yeah. a programmed it, like he programmed a whole like software that essentially takes okay, that's different. All of his inspiration and it generates ideas I mean, that's for awesome. songs. It's fucking crazy. That's fucking cool. I mean, I just heard a, a, a AI generated Nirvana song, like oh. an original Nirvana style composition with like Kurt's voice, and it was very terrifyingly that, accurate. That yeah, had, I'm like so consistently on the fence with releasing music posthumously you know post uh, after yeah. somebody passes yeah, and it's a tough uh, word to say yeah 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 you know what i've actually thought about this like why can't we all just say while we're alive what we want that's hard like, sometimes okay but why can't i be like like it's set we'll put it on the record right now what do you want to do people would be worried if you just like if i just post on instagram like hey guys just in case something happens i want this 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 to come out this i don't ever want to come out you know like yeah but I think that if we all just talked about it more norm, like more normally, I think that would be a net positive thing for the world. I do agree with that. It's just hard to normalize death. Yeah, because it sucks. Yeah, nobody wants to think about it. No, for sure. I don't either. But I think there there could be like a, a time and place to just... Okay, right now. Wait, <laughs> what's the deal with your music? God forbid. All right. If I... God forbid something happens. <laughs> this I is a living we wheel. We should put out a song called Different. Put that one out. A song called... <laughs> I don't have a name for it, but people call it the astrology song. Let's put that one out. Okay. Um, and there's a song called Ill. Let's put that one out too. The rest, let's delete my hard drive. They're not ready, <laughs> and I didn't want them to be shared. <laughs> so the, the other ones are good to go as is? Um, I mean, I won't have a choice. Yeah, get, well, sure. give it to Dan. Let him, you okay, know, yeah, give it to it Dan. Let it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let him finish it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you trust just, him. Yeah, give him the, the treatment. Like, I mean, you have to have the most trust in that man. Oh, for sure. Like creatively, like yeah, it's not even close. Yeah, that's yeah. how special. Like that gives me goosebumps thinking because, about. Well, I mean, for for two things. First of all, obviously he's so good, but second of all, we just have such a rapport at this point where it's like he knows what I like as well. I am worried that if I wasn't there to tell him, he would just go off and do what he <laughs> likes. So Dan, if you are listening, and this insane tragic scenario does happen, go go. Just remember what I would have liked too. You know, <laughs> don't just go crazy. What did you bring to good for you? Like, what did you add to that song? Um, that's a funny story. I mean, um, I went over to Dan's house and he played me like sour, like the, pretty much the whole thing. I think there were a few songs missing, but anyways, and, uh, he played me, I don't know how much of this full story to tell, but anyways, I heard like the acoustic demo of good for you. Okay. And we started working on it literally right there and then, and we FaceTime Olivia and just came up with the vibe and then um yeah i mean like specifically did a bunch of guitar bass drums backup vocals some weird synth parts shit like that oh so you really helped build out the whole song from an acoustic song to what it is now? yeah they, i think they had written it just like on an acoustic guitar in utah where she was shooting high school musical at the time oh wow and then that's where it was and so we literally just facetimed her from dan's studio and just started right there and then after he played it for me for the first time what did it start slow um, like, was it a ballad? No, it wasn't a ballad. Like it had like feel and pace to it, but it was just acoustic. Wow, which is crazy. Why well, don't something funny about Good for You? The the chorus BPM wise is actually slower than the verse, even though it feels way faster. It just goes double time. Why is is, is but, why? Um, because when we when we chose the double time feel in that tempo of the verse, it just felt too fast. So we actually slowed it down, which is like way super antithetical to most traditional pop music yeah. you would never think like the chorus should be slower than the verse and obviously it doesn't feel slower because it goes double time 
But as far as like from a BPM perspective, it is slower. But those things make the difference between yeah. a good song and a great song. But I think that's also what makes Dan special is he's not afraid to do stuff like that. He he only cares about how it feels and how it sounds. He doesn't care about any rules or any preconceived notions of what should happen. It's just like what feels good. So do you feel like you go into the studio not having a formula or some sort of shell? Like is, is there no formula to what you do? Um. I don't think there can be. I think there's just taste. I mean, like there, there certainly is for certain types of super pop music, yeah. you know, like I'm not naive to that, you know, like certain, like, you know, Dua Lipa records, for example, like I, I'm a huge Dua Lipa fan are like much more like mathematical in their presentation of like getting to the hook in a certain amount of time, hitting it back a certain like amount of times. But, um, at least for my music and I think, you know, I'm not speaking for Olivia and Dan, but for Olivia's too. Uh, it's much more just like following the feeling and making things as just dramatic and emotional as possible. Like that's something I learned from Olivia is like, she's like her chief concern when making a song is like, is it dramatic enough? And I love that she uses that word because I think it's so accurate and I think it's so what everyone is searching for. They're searching for like the emotional, I think drama is just like emotional dynamics and that's what people are searching for in music. And I think that's why, you know, it's one of the many reasons she had so much success because she mastered and continues to master just emotional dynamics. And by the way, like incredibly vivid pictures. Like Totally. And then when those emotional dy- dynamics are so mirrored sonically with sonic dynamics, yes. the way Dan does it, it's like, that's just a perfect marriage, you know? I mean, that's you, how you get great songs. I can hear the car in driver's license. Yeah. You know, like totally. that's, in my head right now, I can hear that car. Uh-huh. Yeah, literally. It's, it's wild. Mm-hmm. So we have Aftershock. It is the debut album. Crazy. Listen to it. There's a I can't believe it's out. It still feels crazy that it's out. Like, I've been thinking about this for so long. Like, you work on an album for two fucking years, and then one day it's just out. <laughs> and all, all of done. it is out. Like, like obviously, you release kind of some singles and stuff, too. But, like, in one strike of the clock, an entire body of work that I've had to myself is just out right now. And people can listen to it. And they are listening to it. And they're liking it so far. And I can't, like, I can't even express what that means to me. Like... I will take like a DM over like a thousand streams every day because I'm just like, I can't believe real people are taking real time out of their lives to listen to something I made. Like mm-hmm. I feel so sometimes guilty asking people for that. So when they do it, it is so appreciated. That's really, it's really nice of you. Cause we're busy, you know? And like, not only you're busy, but you're like, your phone is like also vying for you. Like, Hey, look at me, look at me, look at me. No, no, no. Don't listen to that full album. <laughs> you know? And some people are like actively choosing against. They're like, no, I'm going to listen to this full album. And that's awesome. Listen to the full album. Listen to the full album. Link in the description below. I gotta say, I'm couldn't be happier for you, but also like I've known you a while. So long. Like a long time. That's why this feels especially special. We've you know, never like, done this. It's crazy. I I've known you how like eleven years? Ten no, ten? Yes. It has to be at least, right? I think it's it's probably eight. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe a little bit longer than eight. Yeah. Because I met you the first time in New York City. Oh my God, that is true. Yeah, it's probably it is eight. Is it? Because that was that was when I dropped out of college. I've gen yeah. You were going to be a mechanical engineer. That's <laughs> what true. the fuck? Yeah. You were at UPenn, which is an incredibly hard school to get into. Yeah, it was definitely a, a fairly large pivot, but uh, it's it's working out so far. I'm mm. happy with it. Do you consider yourself intelligent? Yeah, I mean, there, I think there's no g- graceful way to answer that question, but but yes, I mean I, I, mean, I do. My dad went to Penn. You must be smart. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I, I consider myself an ex-smart person. Mm, you know? Okay. Do you, I, I try to use my powers for good. <laughs> God evil things. Yeah. Do, what, what do you, how do you apply, or is there anything that you apply from even any sort of mechanical engineering or any sort of highly intelligent skill like that into what you do? I mean, I think maybe subconsciously looking at things a bit more like, numerically you know or or mathematically but not i'm not like running the fucking formulas to figure out how to get the most spotify streams if that's what you're asking (laughs) you know like i've kind of left that part of of myself behind a little bit or at least i I try to and just i'm I'm much more guided by just how things feel now i have found though that like a lot of great songwriters (coughs) and a lot of (coughs) sorry a lot of great comedians are incredibly intelligent like they're very smart I found that, I mean, a lot of my favorite artists and, and people that I'm lucky enough to call friends now are unbelievably smart. And um, there's not just an, in an IQ way, but in an EQ way as well. Mm. People that are just so good interpersonally. And that's... 
And that doesn't always mean not being awkward. Like sometimes you can be like to have social anxiety and still be good interpersonally just because you understand people intrinsically. A hundred percent. You know, I am that I am incredibly awkward and uncomfortable sometimes, but I pretty much understand people. Yeah. And I think that's, that's the more important side to be on if you have to choose one. Between intelligence and emotional intelligence. Um, well, that's not even what I was saying, but yes, I think, I think, I think. So well, I mean, it, it depends. Obviously, if you're fucking working at SpaceX, I would, you're gonna, <laughs> you better be you need to know how to do math. You know, <laughs> like I don't care if you know how to like talk to me in a coffee shop, but if you're gonna be building our rockets. I would hope that you have a pretty good grasp on physics. Actually, don't talk to me. If yeah, you're building yeah, our rockets. yeah. You have more important things to do. Yeah, don't give me brain power. Yeah, don't don't do that. Exactly, I don't need it. Yeah, I don't, the, space needs it. Space needs it. Are you good? The only other question I had is, you just went on tour with Tate, right? Mm-hmm. How do you? put together a live show if it's your show a tate show or a john show wow love this question um yeah it's just on tour with tate and that was really special because i just produced and wrote two songs on her debut album which was really <laughs> awesome because i've i've loved tate i think she's an absolute superstar and she's just the coolest person ever too um that one was fun because i it was kind of back to the more alec benjamin type show where it was just me mm-hmm. and a guitar because it was overseas and and I didn't have that much time to prepare and I was just like let me just do this one acoustic let me see how this goes and and there's benefits to obviously like playing a full band I think musically is is more gratifying because you get to play off other musicians and stuff but um when it's just acoustic and there's no tracks and there's no lights and there's no nothing it really forces you to like really really make a concerted effort to connect with the audience because you can't rely on any other like dimensions to to connect with them and so it was awesome. And then like the John, like going on tour with John Mayer, I was like, it was cool to like, I was like, I know this crowd will appreciate guitar stuff. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I'm a guitar player first. And so like getting to bring that energy into that show was really, really fun to like really lean into like, Hey, we're going to be really musical here and it's going to be like received like intelligently and, and it's going to be appreciated. And then on your own tour, do you kind of take a combination of both? Or it's a combination you- of everything. It's like every side of me melded into one there's so much guitar stuff there's definitely super intimate acoustic moments um there's just funny shit like i don't want it to be like super i'm not like you know me in real life like my music is really serious and sad a lot of the times but i'm not like like that (laughs) outside of my music and i and i don't want to come off as like that outside of my music so i try and like just like give a much more holistic picture of who i am by the way go see alexander 23 on tour we're gonna put a link in the description below also listen to to it aftershock What's your uh, connection to Pink Floyd cover bands? <laughs> I've seen a lot of them. Why? I loved Pink Floyd growing up. So you, and you, you they weren't and they weren't torn. So I saw Australian Pink Floyd. You know <laughs> how many times? <laughs> and they were fucking great. I saw Australian Pink Floyd at least three times. Wow. Uh, and they were great. So go check out me on tour. Go check out Australian Pink Floyd on tour. <laughs> Two great shows. Very different, <laughs> but uh, great nonetheless. Uh, pretty great yeah why not i appreciate you i appreciate you this is such a nice day to, to spend release day thank you guys for also being so well prepared as you always are oh well literally anytime we're always here and uh was a new album new haircut is that what we're going with he cut his hair new, album, new haircut yeah it just felt right it wasn't planned uh, i was just like fuck it i just need to change a pace and also my hair was getting in my food that's something that i'll <laughs> tell you about having long hair is it fucking you're eating like a burrito and your hair is like in your burrito and you're biting your own hair it's it's a disaster and so yeah i just felt like i needed a little change of pace you're one of the few people though in life that look really good with both long long hair and short hair oh, thank you it's fucking frustrating i appreciate that it, which do you prefer like aesthetically um i think i go in waves i get bored of shit quickly mm-hmm. as i'm sure you could also just hear in my music like i just i don't want to do things twice you know and uh so long hair was fun it was fucking cool it was fun on stage to headbang a bit but it was time to clean it up a little bit and a clean alexander 23 mm-hmm. your favorite number 23 yes sir also the day you were born mm-hmm. great number thanks how old are you 23 27 23 <laughs> 23 i just turned 23 for the fourth time, fifth time. i don't fucking know yeah. listen to aftershock link in the description below yeah appreciate you thanks everyone thanks for having me this is fucking awesome L- literally anytime cool. don't say that i'll show up no, I, he, <laughs> you'll be interviewing someone else i'll just be on that side of the couch just hanging that's fine that'd be funny great i could be the third you know guy here. yeah yeah you're smart i think i got some stuff to add honestly i would love to inject the room with some like genuine intelligence let yeah. me know man i'm here
Yeah, I'm here. This is fun. We, we could use a college a for, college dropout. I was Jesus gonna say, Christ. don't say college grad. I, no, least, I made it through one year. Well, that's pretty big. I mean, you yeah. bet. I mean, it's you know. I actually got my math. I was finished a math minor in one year. So holy shit! Did you yeah. really? You are yeah. smart. And a summer session. I still. Oh, okay. So, yeah. <laughs> still a full year. I forgot it all, but I did do it at the time. <laughs> that, so. That's all that matters. Exactly. Please exactly. listen to aftershock. Alexander, twenty three. Everybody. Woo! Thank you. Thank you, guys. You rule.